I want to continue with our study today uh, under the general heading of the Word of Reconciliation. Now, that's been carrying us through a general study of the book of Acts. <clears throat> the book of Acts, written by Luke, he also wrote the Gospel of Luke, is in the position of the historical section of the New Testament. The book of Acts, which actually some of the Acts of some of the Apostles, tells about the beginning of the church, the Lord's church in Acts chapter 2. It tells about the church carrying out the Great Commission in the first years after the church was established. And in so doing, it tells about people being converted to Jesus Christ. And in every case, the word had to be preached. It was the word of reconciliation. So I once again began with what Paul wrote in his second epistle to the Corinthians in chapter 5, beginning in verse uh, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled himself to us by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of, the re of reconciliation. I would pause here and say, I may not have emphasized it before, but the us here is the apostles of Christ and not the whole church. And you'll see this made clear in just a moment. He continues in verse 19, To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing, and another word there is a word that's used in some translations, reckoning, not imputing or reckoning their trespasses, that is their sins, unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead be reconciled to God. Again, I say that the ambassadors of the Christ, as we studied earlier in this general study of the word of reconciliation, are the apostles of Christ. Every member of the church is not an ambassador of Christ. The word ambassador is a formal term to say this is the person in a human government who is recognized by that government to represent to another government the exact position of that government on any particular thing. Thus, they're ambassadors of all governments in the capitals and around so that if you want to know what is the official position of the government of France on something, then this person is the one authorized by France and the one you recognize that can tell you exactly what the position of France, of the French government would be. And so it is. And the government of heaven is, of course, a monarchical government. Jesus is king of king and lord of lords. And it's by his will that we're saved. His will is the New Testament, the last will and testament of Jesus Christ. How did it get here? Well, it came here because through the Holy Spirit, inspired men of the Holy Spirit wrote down exactly, without dependence solely upon their human ability, the will of heaven as God revealed it to them. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. And so we're continuing to emphasize that there are no Christians where the word of God's not been preached because um, they must be reconciled to God. No one knows how to be reconciled to God except that the word of Jesus Christ, the gospel of Christ, the glad tidings of Christ, Romans 1.16, is preached. And that's why the Great Commission came from Christ to the church, and it is the church's responsibility to carry it out, to preach the gospel to every creature. There are no Christians where the gospel has not gone. Now, I want to emphasize then, in this study, Acts chapter 16, you might want to turn now to Acts 16, because we're seeing as the gospel spreads in the first century, that the gospel now reaches out beyond what is known as Asia, specifically what used to be called Asia Minor, where Turkey is today, and goes over into Europe. All the work thus far has been in what's called the Middle East, thus it's Asiatic, and thus it is now going into Europe. We know that man is powerless to save himself. When I speak of being saved, I mean man is sinned. That's a transgression of God's law, 1 John 3, 4. That sin has separated him from God and put him in a lost condition. Man needs God to save him. He can't save himself. So we understand then that God must save him if he is to be saved. And this God will do by his power. Now, not by the power by which he gives animals their life, nor by the power by which he 
created the world or keeps the earth and the starry host all in their places. Not by the power by which he keeps the oceans in their boundaries or the power which he gives to vegetable life, but by that power that he ordained for the specific purpose of saving men from sin. And of course the question rises in, then where did God locate that power? What is that power? Well, we must answer with the scriptures for that's what they're here for. God has not left us without guidance in these matters. 2 Timothy 3, 16 to 17. 2 Timothy 2 and verse 15. And so we read James writing in James chapter 1 and verse 21. Telling Christians even that they are to lay apart all filthiness and superfluity and audience means don't be worldly. Don't live like the world. Don't live like those that don't know what the Bible says. Don't live like those who are non-Christians. And then he says, once you resolve that in your mind to lay that aside, he says, and receive. That's my responsibility to do the receiving. Whatever it is, he says, receive it. And here's what it is. You're to receive it with meekness, with a humble attitude toward God and his will. It must be a submissive attitude. And you receive with meekness what? The engrafted word. Why? It's able to save your souls. James 1.21. That's why this whole series on the word of reconciliation has taken us through the book of Acts or the book of conversions to see how people became Christians in those days when inspired men, inspired of the Holy Spirit, walked this earth. Now we also read in Acts 13 in verse 26, Men and brethren of the stock of Abraham, and whosoever among you feareth God, to you is the word of this salvation sent. But we don't just have those couple of verses. We also uh, read in uh, Ephesians 1.13, Paul writing to the church in Ephesus and reminding them of certain things, instructing them in how to be better in their service to God and the church, for so they are. And he says, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, Ephesians 1.13. And then we're very familiar with this one where Paul begins the book of Romans or the letter to the church in Rome. In Romans 1.16 where he declares, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. I pause here and emphasize this. You'll notice that the gospel is the power to save the believer. A believer in Christ is not saved. That's what the book says. The gospel is the power to save the believer. You can be brought to a correct belief in Christ and you're still not saved. The gospel, the power of God to save, the glad tidings of Christ, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, is the power to save a believer. So that tells me something that sometimes gets overlooked in this verse, and that is that Paul's saying the gospel will save the believer. And that destroys the idea that all you have to do to be saved by Christ is to mentally affirm that he is the son of God and your savior. No, the gospel saves the believer. Is believer essential to salvation? A belief in Christ essential to salvation? Certainly it is. But it doesn't mean you're saved at that point. For the gospel will save the believer. You must be brought to belief. But that doesn't guarantee at that moment you're saved. For the gospel will save the believer. But we find also, going further into this matter... 1 Corinthians 15, 1 and 2, where Paul's explaining the gospel of the Corinthians. They had heard it, they had believed it, they had obeyed it. He reminds them of it to encourage them to greater service in the church. And we find him writing, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you. You know, back about, I don't know, 75, 80 years ago or further back, there were people that saying, You can't preach the gospel to the church. You preach doctrine to the church. You preach gospel to the unbeliever. Well, they make a distinction between gospel and doctrine. The Bible doesn't make. To preach the doctrine of Christ is to preach the gospel of Christ. To preach the gospel of Jesus Christ is to preach the doctrine of Christ. And so Paul says here, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. Well, these are brethren. These are already members of the church. And he says, I'm declaring unto you the gospel of uh, which I preached unto you. So they had heard it, and by that same gospel, the power of God to save them, they had believed and obeyed it and become Christians. And now he says, as Christians, I'm preaching the gospel unto you. 
And he says, I preach it unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved. But it's predicated upon their continuance in it. He says, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 and 2. Now these passages and others like them make it exceedingly clear that God's power to save the sinner from sin is in his infallible, inerrant, all-sufficient, final and complete revelation of God to man, the New Testament of Jesus Christ, the seed of the kingdom, which is the word of God, Luke 8, 11, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, Ephesians 6, 17. In other words, the instrument the Holy Spirit uses to convict a person of sin, convert him to Christ, and to keep him faithful in the church is the word of God, our word of reconciliation. Now, you know, some years ago in our country, you had trolleys that were moved originally by horse, horses. And then you had trolleys in the various cities. Maybe you've seen some old pictures or else Hollywood depicting something like that in a movie to where they moved to uh, trolleys that were driven by electricity. And they have uh, tracks their own, and uh, they have connectors on top of the trolleys to wires that give them the electricity. And when the trolleyman pushes the lever forward, the electricity is able to act, and the thing moves. Uh, the last time I was on one like that was in Murmansk, Russia, and uh, that's how we traveled up and down the main street, Lenin Street at that time. And so what you have here is that the uh, movement comes through an avenue. It comes through wires. It comes through cables. The power is in the electricity. But it's not just direct. I saw a picture just recently of these storms going through out up here in Texas to where there was a direct impact of a bolt of lightning on a tree right outside of school blew the thing all to pieces. Well, that's direct. They tell me in these lightning strikes that if you could harness that thing, there'd be enough in it to run Houston maybe for a year or so. A lot of power in that. And yet when it's channeled correctly, it can do a lot of good. But it must be channeled correctly. Now, when it comes to the gospel reaching us, there's no direct from God's divine eternal spirit to our created spirit. He works through a medium. Now the Holy Spirit is the one that revealed the mind of God, 1 Corinthians 2. He's the one to do that because he is God, as we studied early on uh, a couple of weeks ago in our study in the afternoon. The Holy Spirit's a person like Jesus is a person, like the Father is a person. But when we're saved, we're not saved by the very spirit of deity contacting our spirit. Yeah, the spirit does it, God does it, Christ does it, but he does it through a certain avenue. He does it through a medium. So it's God through the spirit by the word of the inspired apostles that gave us the New Testament. And that's how the gospel reaches any of us. That's how we all learn of the will of heaven. You even learn you were a sinner because God told you. He didn't kill you directly, but he told you in the infallible word. Now, in the parable of the sower found in uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Matthew 13, Mark 4, and Luke chapter 8, you see that the word of God is a seed. You see that the inward man or the heart or the mind of man is the soil into which the word of God, the seed, is sown. Thus it involves teaching somebody. The word is taught to somebody. It is those who understand and who keep that word, who do what God said in the way God said it and for the reason or more than one reason he said it, that is saved, that remains saved, that if you please they bear fruit. All the way from the seed sown in the mind of man up to its germination, its growth and development and fruit bearing. So the divine order set out in your Bible, in your New Testament specifically, is hearing. Hearing the gospel where God's located his power to save you. Hearing the gospel. Well, it's not just hearing audibly, not understanding. Hearing means understanding. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. One's confidence, trust, belief in God 
and godly things, which involves the Word of God, which Word creates by understanding on our part, our understanding of God and of salvation and how man is saved, what God's done for us we couldn't do for ourselves, and how we appropriate what God did for us to save us that we have good do for ourselves by our belief and obedience to the terms of salvation set out in the New Testament. So understanding takes place in the heart or the inward man where the mind is. You can even substitute heart for mind and mind for heart a heart for the inward man, your spirit. So there's the understanding. And when that understanding takes place from a humble heart, a heart desirous of knowing and doing God's will, then one is converted. He's changed. You can't change somebody outwardly. You have to change them inwardly. You start changing their attitude and their thinking, and you'll start changing the way they live, their actions. And when they accepted the truth, that is, as we started out, and they received with meekness the engrafted, or American Standard says, implanted word, and they submitted to the mandates of Prince Emmanuel set out therein, the Spirit moved upon them through his instrument, the sword, the word of God, the seed of the kingdom, and they embraced the truth, and by their humble submission to the truth, then they were saved. Their forgiveness took place. Well, where does forgiveness take place? In the mind of God. He's the one we sinned against. Our sins may have involved other people, but ultimately and finally, all sins are against God. So we understand then that that's the divine order. Hearing, understanding with the heart, being converted to God or to Christ or the whole New Testament Christian system. That involves a turning on our part according to the direction that the Word of God gives us. And thus, in being baptized, that's the final act of consummation of becoming a Christian, one has remission of sins, one is forgiven in the mind of God, and thus salvation is ours, Acts 28, verse 27. So in all the divine record, there, now listen, in all of the divine record, there is not a single case, not a single case, where a person was saved by the gospel, where it was not heard, and it was not understood. That's one reason that a little baby can't become a Christian. First of all, he's never sinned, so he's not separated from God. Because you see, the sins transgress God's law, 1 John 3, 4. And thus he doesn't need salvation because he's S-A-F-E, safe. He never has been lost, so he doesn't have to be saved. He's just safe. But now when we grow up and know right from wrong and know our accountability to God and we violate God's will, we're separated from God and we're in need of a Savior because we can't save ourselves. And no group of men can save us from our sins. So we're saved by the gospel of Jesus Christ. And nobody's saved apart from the gospel. Thus man must hear and man must understand the gospel. And therefore the Great Commission, go you into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Then notice the learning involved between that and the next statement. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. Mark 16, 15, 16. It's obvious by the ver uh, what's said in verse 16 uh, that something had to take place in those that were believing and being baptized. They had to understand. They had to understand the gospel message. They had to grasp it. They had to know what God did for them to save them, what Jesus did for them. Then they had to understand how do I appropriate those things to me. And there are terms of salvation set out in the gospel so that I can accept what I don't deserve, what I never will deserve, but I can by faith submit to the will of heaven and prove my faith to God, my love of God, and be blessed with what I don't deserve. And that's the salvation of my soul presented to me in the great word of reconciliation. While the growth of the church and the spread of the religion of Christ is certainly a marvel of any age, Yet when you see the development from the time the church was established on Pentecost in Jerusalem in Acts 2 until the time that we come to Acts 16, there had been some 20 years before the gospel was gotten into what we know as Europe. 20 years. We're in a transition stage. At this time, there's no written New Testament, but they're Christians. The whole thing is in the wisdom of God, his providential care as he establishes his son's church and gets the gospel into the world. So some 20 years passed before Europe hears the word of reconciliation. Now the first fruits that were in Philippi, a chief city of Macedonia named after Philip of Macedon, the father of Alexander the Great, 
we find that uh, God saw in that city two families that were told about by Luke as the Holy Spirit said, you write down this Luke, this is what I want people to now to the end of time know about. Two families in that city. One we would call a businesswoman or a merchant woman and her household. And the other, quite a different person from Lydia, a man who was the keeper of the city prison, which probably it was a pretty tough hombre, and his family. But the Lord said these two had a condition of heart. They're ready to be saved. That's always amazed me at the knowledge and wisdom of the Almighty. He can look in the hearts of all men. And he can know, regardless of what we may see them looking like and how they do on the outside, that that soil is ready to receive with meekness and grafted word, and they be saved thereby. If God saves sinners directly without the gospel, well, here was a suitable place to do it. The New Testament, as I said earlier, was not written down. All of it that was then known was in the minds of the apostles put there by the Holy Spirit. That's the reason the early church continued steadfastly in the Apostles' Doctrine, Acts 2.42. We have the Apostles' Doctrine today. You see, inspiration at one time was in man, so they followed the living apostles. But they committed that knowledge the Holy Spirit put there by divine guidance of inspiration, and we have it in the book today. And it's infallible because God guaranteed that though heaven and earth would pass away, His Word would never pass away. So all of it that was then known was in the minds of the apostles and those who had learned it from them or others. Instead of going directly to them, independent of any medium, he went to work with Paul, to whom the word of reconciliation had been committed. And he did that in order to bring him and those to be saved together. He was approximately 200 miles away. And with the means of travel of that day uh, that was then available, then much time would be required for them to get together. We think about traveling from here to Dallas, about 200 miles, and yeah, that's about four hours driving up the interstate, barring a flat or getting run over or running into somebody or something like that. But normally that's the way it is. Well, think about starting out walking and see how long it will take you to get up there, especially over terrain that was not too favorable. Or think about riding in a wagon or driving a buggy or Surrey or something like that, as they had to do years ago. And it would take a while to get from here, especially if you've got a family with you and having to travel in a wagon from here to Dallas. And we don't realize how blessed we are, do we, just in travel nowadays. Miraculously and providentially, Paul, with his companions, was directed on this long journey until he reached the great city of Philippi. Acts 16, verses 6 through 12. You can read the details of it. There he was a stranger in a strange land. And as a rule in commercial cities, there were Jewish synagogues where the Jews would assemble for worship. On every seventh day of the week, which was according to the law of Moses, the Sabbath. And when Paul was in any of these cities where there was a synagogue, he would go into those synagogues as it was uh, permissible for Jews to do. And thus he had a better means of reaching the people with the gospel because he would come upon the people who were truly religious and their mind was based upon the law of Moses and he had something to work with. But if you study about Philippi, you'll find it was a military city. It was um, an agricultural city. And you had to have a certain amount of Jews living in a place before they would build a synagogue. And there's no synagogue there. So there's very few Jews there, probably only those like this woman who were uh, in business. It was customary in cities of this sort where there was no synagogue for the Jews to find a place of peace and harmony as much as you could and there they would on the sabbath retire in order to meet for prayer and contemplation on the scriptures well you know paul had to find that out and so he had the bible doesn't tell us about all his questions and answering who he went to to find out but there the place of prayer was at the riverside paul had been in the city just a few days, so I know he had to do some inquiring. And when the Sabbath came, he knows where they meet, so he goes there with them 
this place of prayer. And here we introduce to the woman who's the merchant woman. She is Lydia, verses 13 and 14. Now she's somebody that deals with the wealthy because she's a seller of purple, and that's not by accident mentioned. It's really it's the scarlet of the aristocrats. It was not cheap cloth that she sold. So she would be somebody who knew how to get along with people who were of the more educated and ruling classes. And the history of the conversion of herself and her house is given then by Luke in a few words. Paul, you know, sat down and spoke to the woman. Lydia listened to the words Paul had to say. And by those words, Lydia's heart or inner man or mind was open to the point to what Scripture says she attended to the things spoken by Paul. And upon understanding, because now we know it's the word of reconciliation that he preaches to her, the gospel of Christ. And upon her hearing this, she and her house were baptized. You know, that tells me that one of the things she attended to when it came to the words of Paul preaching was the requirements of one that, uh, that had to meet, one had to meet in order to become a Christian. You know, we remember that when the Ethiopian eunuch was preached to, the scripture says Philip said, preached unto him Jesus, and yet the very next thing was, it came to a certain water, he said, see, what does it mean to be baptized? So in the process of preaching Jesus, if I don't preach baptism, something's wrong. And the same was true when Philip was there in Samaria. He preached things pertaining to Christ and the kingdom of heaven, and yet he was baptizing people. That's just another way of saying he preached the gospel and preached the terms of entrance into the kingdom, or he preached the terms of salvation. These people understood him. Giving attendance to him like she did, she understood, understood the gospel, preached in the terms of salvation. She embraced them, and she and her household were baptized. Now, David Lipscomb, in his commentary on Acts of the Apostles, says this of Lydia's conversion. I'm quoting. She heard the gospel as preached by Paul, and through the Lord, and, and uh, through and through that, the Lord opened her heart to receive the teachings. So she attended to or gave heed to the things that she heard. There was nothing mysterious or singular about this. Men opened one another's hearts by presenting to them the truth, enlightening their minds, and changing their affections from one person or thing to another. This God did for Lydia by words spoken by Paul. You know, that's not something that is amazing. I often hear Buddy give illustrations when he was a salesman. This is true of any salesman. I want to know how uh, Buddy changed people's minds if they weren't ready to buy what he had to sell over to wanting to buy what he had to sell if he didn't use words. Can you imagine Buddy coming up to somebody or any salesman, walking into a place of business, he's got something that he thinks that business needs, and he walks up there and just stands and stares at the person. Or he walks up to him, picks up something off the floor, and just knocks him in the head. That doesn't communicate what he wants to communicate. <laughs> It'll communicate something, and it's very direct. But it doesn't have much to do with enlightening the mind. might put the mind out, but it doesn't enlighten him. No, what you find is that's the very purpose of words. In fact, if you're listening to me, you're listening to words, you're understanding what they mean, and you're getting the message. You're being persuaded, hopefully. If you need to be. Now there need be no trouble about the matter anyway. Uh, because that's just the way things work with people. It's the way that we communicate with people. You know, you husbands, if you pop the question to your hopefully wife, you try to persuade her that uh, you are the best thing out among men, that she ought to marry you. That's a pretty good task. We'll say more about that. Well, passing from this, we come to another conversion in the same city of Philippi. Because Paul had cast what was called a spirit of divination out of a woman, he, she was controlled by men, and they were using that to make money off of her. You see, people always made money off false religion, even among the pagans. They had no knowledge of the gospel but they had something here at work for them to make money, and people always see it when it comes to making money. If you can't keep people to see some things, figure out some way to show them it has to do with money, and they'll tend to understand what you're talking about. 
Well, anyway, they cast out this de de uh, demon or spirit. And because of this, making a long story a little shorter, they got hauled into court. He and Silas were brought before the rulers, and they just frankly beat the stuffings out of them, laid many stripes on them. And they put them in prison, not only in prison, but in the inward prison, and told that jailer, you keep them securely. And nor do this, the jailer put them in the inner prison, and he made their feet fast in the stocks. Now, you've seen pictures of men in jail or somewhere uh, years ago when they did this kind of thing. And they just put their feet straight out in stocks. They couldn't move them, and they'd sit like that. And, of course, we don't realize it, but just sitting straight like that, your feet right out in front of you, just try that sometime, don't move them. And you'll be pretty miserable pretty quick. But the Romans were masters at making it hurt worse and knowing how to do it. So rather than like this, they spread the legs out like that and locked them in there. Now, try that sometimes. Just put your feet like that and see how long you can last, especially when you can't move them. So that's the condition. They've been terribly whipped. Now they're put in the inner prison, and they're in that shape. Their backs are lacerated. They can't feel good, folks, to say, to say the best. And at midnight, what do we find them doing? Singing praises to God. The Scripture says the prisoners heard them. Must have amazed those folks. But then suddenly... There was an earthquake that unsettled the foundation of the prison, opened the doors of the prison, and loosed the bands of the prisoners. Then we see the pagan mentality of the jailer. He's a guy, he must be accountable to these rulers. And he can't, what's he going to do? He just knows everybody's run off. That's what prisoners do when they have the doors or cells opened and they have the opportunity. We read of it regularly. But Paul jumps out and says, don't do yourself any harm. We're all here. That must have amazed him that they would all be there. So, do thyself no harm, for we are all here. And that so amazed the man, the jailer, that he called for a light. And Scripture says he sprang in, and he came trembling. And he fell down before Paul and Silas and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? I don't know what all was on his mind, verses 28 through 30 of Acts 16. All I know is this so impressed that mind, and he has no background in the Old Testament. He's not a Jew. He's a pagan Gentile. But this shows something about the heart of that man that God knew aforetime. The question shows that the jailer believed there was something for him to do and that he had the capacity, he had the ability, he had the capability, and he was willing to do what was required. You know, you've gone a long way with somebody when you find somebody like that. A lot of times you have to try to persuade people from the Scriptures that they need to do anything. This man already had a disposition of mind that says, what must I do? It also indicates that in salvation, man is both active and at the same time passive. Active in doing what God requires of him. Passive in the willingness to receive the terms of salvation that God gives him and that are said in the word of reconciliation, the gospel of Christ. To understand fully an answer to a question, it is necessary to know the attitude, the mindset of the questioner. What then was the attitude of this jailer? toward the gospel of Jesus Christ. Remember, he was an unbeliever because he has not heard the word, and faith comes by hearing the word, Romans 10, 17. Now, he believed the apostles. He had seen things in them that attested to divine things regarding them. That very night he had seen that. And that caused him to fall at their feet and ask them this. I do not understand all about the miracle that was done in the earthquake, but that was sufficient to tell me it did these things to him. Now, he had never heard the gospel. Therefore, he did not have the wherewithal to be brought to a correct belief in Jesus Christ to be Savior. So to the question, men and brethren, what shall I do or what must I do to be saved? Coming from an unbeliever, you must take him where you find him. He's not a believer. You have to give him the wherewithal 
to become a believer. And so he is told, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. Verse 31, but at this point, while he's received the answer, he doesn't have the wherewithal to do that. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And in order that he might have the wherewithal to do it, then he has to be taught. You know, that tells me something. I can tell a fellow what he ought to do because he asked me the question. That doesn't mean I've told him how to do it. That's why somebody can say, well, you people in the church of Christ, in your worship, you just sing. Is that right? Yes. Now, have I answered him correctly? Yes. Hopefully, he'll say, why? <laughs> but he may not. But I've still given him the answer. If you study the Lord, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you'll see many times he uttered things and did things just to see, are you really interested in this or just a matter of passing curiosity? And when it was a passing curiosity, he went on by his business. And so we in the Lord's church and carrying the gospel of the lost ought to have ways of saying, are you really interested? Do you really want to know? Do you have an attitude like this man who hadn't even heard the gospel? But God knew ahead of time he had a soil that the seed of the kingdom could be sown in, and he would believe it when the evidence was presented. So the jailer became a believer, and his faith led him right on in the line of obedience to the gospel. Because if you look at the record, Paul gave him what he needed. He preached the truth to him. And he took them, that is Paul and Silas, the same hour of the night, and washed their stripes, and was baptized, he and all his straightway. Verse 33. I want to talk about the latter part of this. He and all his straightway. This is late at night. Earthquake came at midnight. It's late night, early in the morning. I've seen people say, I want to be baptized. Okay, we'll do it. No, I want to wait till Mama can be there. Okay, we'll wait till Mama's there. You have no authority from heaven to do that. My grandmother told me ages ago... <laughs> back in the early part of the 19th century. And I don't know why brethren did this a lot of times then. They would have these protracted meetings and they would get a number of people who want to obey the gospel and then they have a baptizing day. So somebody might want to be baptized today and they end up baptizing them on Tuesday when several others had indicated that. Well, they didn't have any authority to do that. Uh, I don't know if I'm be alive by Tuesday. She told about a lady who responded to the gospel invitation and literally became sick that night because they were waiting to baptize her with several others. And the lady died before she was baptized. Now I know the emotion says, well, she indicates she wanted to be saved. And my response is, well, she should have gone ahead and done it. <laughs> Amazing how we, even in the church, some kind of say, well, we should be all right anyway. You're not all right till you're all right. And you're not all right till from the heart you've obeyed that form of doctrine which was delivered to you, being then made free from sin, you become servants of righteousness. When's the then? When you're obedient to the gospel completely and being immersed in water by the authority of Christ in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to obtain the remission of sins. Now, if you're going to say there are exceptions to that, then where do you stop? The truth of the matter is, every one of us, as soon as we learn the truth regarding our salvation, had better not put it off. You don't have any guarantee you'll even be here this afternoon. And if you need to obey the gospel, then you need to do whatever repenting that needs to be done and turning away from whatever you're doing now that's contrary to God's will for Christians and then do what he said if you're outside of Christ, be baptized for the remission of sins, having complied with the rest of the steps in God's plan of salvation. Well, the same hour of the night, and there's your Bible example, he did this. He even demonstrated the fact that he repented in the sense that he's trying to make amends for what had been done to him. He's washing their stripes. He's doctoring them. He takes them into his house. If that doesn't have this repentance, I don't know what would. And so then he, they're baptized when they understand the word of reconciliation, the terms of pardon set out in it, and how Christ through the gospel saves men. So in perfect harmony with the word of reconciliation, committed to the apostles in all the cases of reconciliation or conversion that we've examined thus far and you will find in your Bible. There was the preaching of the word. There was faith created in the people that heard it by understanding it, faith in Christ. There was the keeping of the commandment following faith to repent, Acts 17.30. 
And then there was a final obedience, complete obedience, completing their obedience to the gospel and being baptized for the remission of sins. That's not nearly it. That's it. And anybody that preaches anything else is not preaching to you the whole counsel of God on this given matter. We in the Lord's church have for years set out the truth and so doing the terms whereby people become Christians. Folks, it's not difficult intellectually to understand. The problem is folks don't believe it. That's what it says, but people will start out. Well, why don't you just go with what you admit it says. That's what this man did, and that's what Lydia did. One with a background in the Old Testament, the other one a pagan that didn't know it at all. But look at their hearts. Their hearts was open to the truth. They were honest. And when the evidence, adequate evidence, was given in the preaching of the word that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the only begotten Son of God, the only Savior of the world, the way, the truth, and the life, that no man comes to the Father but by Him, they were willing to receive His terms of pardon, humbly submit to it, and they were baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. That's how you become a Christian. And you can't become one except that you do that. If you're not a child of God this morning, we've given to you the truth. We hope you'll receive it as these people did and obey it if you need to become a Christian. As a child of God, have you committed sin that you haven't repented of? And God's second law of pardon, you need to. And you need to come confessing those sins and praying God for forgiveness. Once again, walk the straight and narrow way of divine truth. But folks... Unless you're willing to repent of your sins, the rest of it won't work. It just won't. And you need to know then what it is that you need to give up in order to be ready to be fully obedient to the gospel. You might as well say, well, I'll baptize you when you're saying, well, I don't even believe in Christ. Well, you wouldn't baptize somebody like that, I don't think. Not if you were fully desirous of obeying God. And so it is, you must meet every step in the plan of salvation. Hearing and understanding the word, believing in Christ, repenting of your sins, confessing your faith in the Christ, Romans 10, 10, and being baptized for the remission of sins. Come to Jesus while together we stand and sing.